Well, hello there, everyone. Thanks for joining me uh, on this Friday afternoon. It is crazy windy over here in San Diego today. Um, we've got these Santa Ana winds, so everything is blowing like mad around here. So it's always a little scary when it gets super windy, because when it gets super windy, you sometimes get fires, which is, yeah, you know, very nervous time. But so far, it's okay. But I hope you're all doing really well. Uh, we've got a full house already. Uh, hey, Donna and Susan is here. Monique. Hey, Monique. Carla is here. Uh, Nancy is here. Wow, we've got a packed group. Elsie is here. Um, uh, Pat is here. Hey, everyone. So if I missed your name, sorry. Um, Chris is here. Hey, Chris. So we've got a lot of people here, which is very cool. And uh, so I'm going to try something a little different tonight. We're going to do a little experiment. Um, last week, I believe, we tried a floating cup with a cloud formula. Well, we're going to do something a little bit similar to that tonight. I'm going to try a floating cup, uh, floating cup pour with two different cloud mixtures, like two different colors mixed with the cloud formula. What's going to happen? I have no idea. So, uh, but it's a very simple color palette. It's just a black and white uh, with a little bit of silver and some pewter to add a little uh, more interest. Um, but I just, I'm just really anxious and curious to see what would happen with all of this cloud paint all mixed together in a floating cup pour. So we'll give it a try and uh, see what happens. So, um, and uh, if you have any questions along the way, um, feel free to throw them in the comments. Hope you're all doing well and had a great week and hope you hopefully you have a, a fun weekend coming up. Um, which will be very cool. So I'm just going to flip the camera over and uh, show you what we're going to do. So here we go. I'm going to uh, turn it over here and I got my uh, canvas all ready to go. We're doing a, a 12 by 16 tonight, just a stretched canvas. And uh, here are my paints, just four of them. It's a very simple color palette, um, but it's a fun one. I really like this super simple color palette. You can get some very pretty paintings with it. They're um, kind of contemporary. And um, whenever I try something crazy and new, like a new experiment, I like to kind of limit the colors and kind of do a, you know, it's it's a more control, a little more controlled color palette. Um, so you can kind of see what happens with the effects. So we've got a black cloud mix right here. And I've got a white cloud mix right here. And here is uh, my pewter, uh, which I love from Amsterdam. And here is my silver, which is just, a, I think, Artist Loft silver, which is a, a nice silver, kind of a medium, uh, kind of a medium grayish type of silver. And these two are just mixed, uh, two parts Floetrol, one part paint in each of these, a little bit of water to get the very slight mound that I like. And uh, I'm using the Easy Cloud mixture for this one. And I wrote it down. so. Um, it would be a little easier to show you what I got. So here is the easy cloud formula. It's two parts Floetrol, one part of the bare satin enamel, and then one part paint. And in the black, I used the deep base bare satin enamel. And in the white, I used the ultra white uh, bare satin enamel. So the same paint, basically same brand, just uh, this is the white one, this is the uh, deep base one. Uh, and then the black is, um, uh, Artist Loft Flow Acrylic Black, and the white is Craft Smart White, and that is where is the Craft Smart? So it's just this this kind of cheap uh, Craft Smart Satin Acrylic paint um, for my white, and the uh, formula is right there. It two parts Floetrol, one part bare, and then uh, one part paint, and uh, a little bit of water to. Um, not too much, I didn't use any water in the white, but a little bit in the black, uh, just to get a little bit uh, thinner. So that's kind of what we're gonna do tonight. I thought that would be kind of fun. Um, I've got my cup all ready to go, my floating cup. And for a 12 by 16, we need seven and a half ounces of paint. So I've got that marked off and ready to fill it up. I've got my little tape tab right on there for my floating uh, cup, my floating cup tab, I guess I should call that. Uh, so we're ready to um, fill our cup up, and then I'm just going to use the cloud, uh, the black cloud mix, for my base coat. So 
going to have a lot of cloud mix in this one. And I'm just going to flip over to comments to see if there's any uh, anything that's popped up. No, not yet. Um, so, all right, I will continue on here. So, cool. Let me, um, I'll just leave the cloud mix thing up there for now. Um, in case anyone new pops on, they'll see what we're doing. And so let's layer our cup and then I'll spread out our base coat. I think I'm going to start with the white. So I'm going to just pour a little bit of white in the bottom. We got a touch more. And I'm not going to, you, you could do all floating layers for the, a floating flip cup or a flip cup. Uh, I might do a little bit of a, a, a high pour just to get things blended up a little bit more. We'll see how that works. Next up, I'm going to go with my uh, pewter color, I think. And just kind of pour a little bit of that in there. Then I think I'll put in some of the black cloud mix. And then here is some of the silver. There we go. And what's next? Back to white, maybe. And for the white, I think I'll do a little bit of a high pour. Um, so the white's going to kind of shoot all the way into that cup. And that is going to cause a little bit of uh, mixing and blending that might maybe create some interesting cloudy effects, perhaps. We'll find out. There's a little more uh, silver. And for the uh, black, I'm also going to do a little bit of a high pour with the black cloud mix. Maybe that'll create some cool interest. And then one more layer of the white. I'm just going to do regular white layer. We'll go back to the uh, pewter here. So maybe a little silver, a little more black. And we're almost right up to our line. Perhaps, perhaps a touch more, a little bit more of a high pour with the white. Why not? All right, cool. So we've got our cup all layered up and uh, there's all kinds of colors in there doing interesting things, floating around. Uh, I'm going to put this to the side for a moment. And I'm going to hide my uh, formula here and let's spread our base coat on. So I just need a, a thin base coat and then I'm going to put a little bit of a puddle uh, in the center for our floating cup. So here we go. So I'm not trying to mimic like a, a pearl pour or anything. Um, these paints are too thick for a pearl pour, but uh, I'm just curious to see what will happen with some of these techniques when you mix in uh, the cloud, cloud mixtures. So, and I've been thinking about this one for since I since we worked on uh, the flip cup last week, and um, so I had to get my question answered, and we will soon, at least with this painting. All right, so there we go. We've got a thin base coat. I'm gonna just pour kind of a thinner, a smallish puddle in the center, and I can uh, tilt that around. I just want a little bit more paint to do our flip cup, flip our cup into. That looks pretty good. All right. So I need to get my, my flipper out. And here we go. I'm going to check and see if there's any questions before we uh, do the flip. So here we go. Let's see. Um, Nancy's got a question about uh, sales. Well, you could answer that. I'll answer that um, in a little bit, Nancy. It's a good question. Sorry, I lost my connection. Um, and Donna just, just asked, uh, I lost my connection a second. Does all of those paints have the cloud mixture in them? No, just two of them, Donna. So only the cloud mix is the black and the white. So these are the cloud mixtures. I have a silver and the pewter 
but those are just mixed standard, uh, just two parts Floetrol, one part paint. So, and uh, cool. And then um, Nancy said, um, you said that cheap paints aren't really archival paint. Um, not necessarily. I mean, cheaper paint, it depends on the paint, really. Uh, craft paints, I mean, aren't archival quality. Uh, I'm not really looking at this as a, a sellable painting. This is just an experiment in a test. Um, and this is just my easy cloud mixture. If I wanted to do this, and if it works, I can always use my better cloud mixture, which uses uh, more expensive paints or better paints. So it all depends um, what you're doing, though. So, but uh, but there's a lot that goes into a sale price of a painting. So we might talk about that um, down the road a little bit or a little later tonight. And uh, Carla is asking, is the consistency the basic thickness? You bet, Carla. It's just my regular old consistency with that slight mound. Um, there's the regular one. All right. So that's it for now. Uh, and then Donna said... Um, Black cloud mix is, and that was, uh, I put the banner up, and this is the black cloud. So they're both mixed the same way. The black cloud and the white cloud um, are two parts Floetrol, one part bare satin enamel. Uh, I used the deep base for the black, and I used the ultra white base uh, for the white. So they're both bare satin enamels, though. And then there's just black paint in here and white paint in here. And that is it for our cloud mixtures. All right, cool. So, all right, let's flip this thing and see what happens. So I got my cup. I got my uh, cup flipper device. I'm gonna flip her over and I'm gonna just drop it in my puddle. That looks good. It's wanting to move around a little, but that's all right. I'm just going to let it sit there for a second. I'm going to always try to wipe off my chopper <laughs> right after. Sometimes I fail. It's pretty dirty, as you can see. But uh, just to clean it off. All right. So we have got our cup on. Let me move these paints out of the way. And here we go. I've got my tape tab. I'm going to just release that and it's going to start floating around any minute now. There we go. Sometimes it takes a, a second or two for the, the uh, air to release the paint. And it's looking cool. I'm going to just uh, float it around a bit. Perhaps lift it, let a little more paint out. Float that around. And then uh, usually once is about enough. And then you can kind of just pull the cup off. I'm going to see what we got. So we've got a, an interesting white uh, center there. Uh, I'm going to take a sip of water really quick. <clears throat> okay, so do I want to alter that at all? Um, I don't know. I want to, maybe I'll just try this. Just put a little ring, a couple little rings in there. That's going to change as we stretch and tilt. I kind of like it. Let's just leave it and see what happens. And uh, I'll put this aside. We're getting a lot of cells, which is cool. Um, that might be from the cloud mix. I know it's probably from the metallics uh, that we're using in there, but there's a lot of cells happening right now, which I like. So let's start tilting and see uh, what we get. Um, all right, where do I want to go? I'm going to just expand my puddle like normal. And tilt this around. Okay. 
And then there we go. So let's choose a corner uh, to tilt off of. I think I'll just start with this one right here. And it's looking cool. All these cells are starting to kind of expand. This is kind of typical of like a cloud formula, some of this lacing that we're getting. So I like that. Let's do this corner next. All right. So I think I'll go to this corner down here. I think I, I think a lot of our white kind of blended, the high pores that we used kind of blended in with some of the other colors. Interesting, we got this giant, I think that was a little uh, drop of paint. Now it's a great big drop of paint, but it's kind of an interesting cell look, so I'll just leave it for now. And uh, let's do our final, our final corner. Actually, right here, we've got a lot of the dark cloud mix. Maybe I'll put some of the, use some more of that and kind of, It's not really a like a, it's not really a a negative space. It's just kind of a dark corner, I'd call it. We'll kind of keep that corner dark, perhaps. And I'll pour some of that off just to cover the edges a bit. And let's see what we got. So I've got some bare edges over here. I'll just use my fingers and kind of push the paint up the side of the canvas. That works pretty good. So there we go. We've got all of our corners and edges covered. And let's take a look at our floating cup. I kind of like, I like it. We don't have tons of like cloud, cloudy effects. Um, but we do have lots of cool effects. And one that I notice is uh, whenever I use the, like a dark cloud mix, I get the, this lacing and it's this kind of subtle lacing. It might be difficult to see, but there's all these like very subtle, slight, uh, lines in there, lacing lines. And that's typical of the dark cloud mix. And that happens a lot with the white cloud mix too. It's just, it's much more noticeable uh, with the lighter cloud mix. So I kind of like it. I, it's time to decide if we want to uh, do anything else to this, any more tilting. Um, I'm just looking at it for a moment. Deciding on uh, there's something else I want to do. We're getting some interesting like cell things happening around here. I think this is just like a drop, but it looks kind of like a cell. Um, let's see. I don't love all this stuff that's happening right here in this corner. It looks too much like a sharp line um, that's going right up and down the, the canvas. I don't love that. I think I'm going to tilt that. Maybe I'll pull the white over there so we can have a lighter corner. Let's give it a, a try. So just turn this and let the paint go down there a little bit. Let's 
this will also create some other things and stretch some other things and maybe some other uh, effects will happen. So I like that better already, having that lighter corner. So, all right. I'm just kind of recentering the paint a little bit, doing some little little adjustments. There we go. It's an interesting uh, orientation this way. I think I like it. I like it a little bit more that way, but uh, you never know. We'll let it dry and see. That's kind of a cool orientation like that. That's kind of cool. So I'll leave it like that for a minute. I kind of like that. So it's an interesting painting. It didn't, I really didn't have any expectations um, using two cloud mixes. We did get some, some things happening with the black cloud mix that I've seen before that's happened. The white didn't really do a whole lot. We're getting a little bit right in here, a little bit of like cloudy effects, but not a ton. The other thing we could do, and maybe I'll try it just because this is an experiment, is stretch it this way and just kind of stretch this white out. Perhaps uh, we'll get some more interesting effects with a little bit uh, moving the paint around a little more. Plus we have a lot of interesting things happening right down here on this uh, corner, on this edge. And I normally don't like that at all because all of the interest, you want it in the painting, more in the central quadrants of the painting, not along the edges. So I think I'll tilt some of that out. It'll stretch the paint out, we'll expand the white. Maybe we'll get some more, some more interesting things happening. Let's give it a shot. Why not? Cool. Just a little more, I think. I like this. I like what's happening. There we go. So we just kind of stretched out. Uh, we stretched off some of that, uh, some of the interest that was on the edge which I like a lot more. Um, I think anything that's really interesting, you don't want it on the edges or the corners because um, it just pulls the viewer's eye right out of the painting. You want to keep all the interesting stuff happening in the, in the center. And, but we've expanded the white areas, which I like a lot. Um, so before the white was like kind of up in this little tiny corner We've kind of moved it over this way and we stretched it back down this way. I think it's a more balanced painting, like compositionally wise. Um, so I like it. So it's, it's, um, I don't think you'd tell, oh wow, there's a lot of cloud mix in this painting if you just looked at it. Um, but we know, but it did give us some very cool lacing, which I really like, which uh, sometimes can happen but uh, it happens a lot when you're using like a dark cloud mixture or the white cloud mix. And we've got some interesting things happening in there. So I'd say it's, you know, an interesting experiment. Um, it's not blowing my socks off as far as like, like a brand new, you know, technique or anything like that. But I think it's worth like experimenting with again, perhaps. So so we'll see down the road. Let me throw these away. So let me check and see if there are any uh, any questions. I'm sure there are. 
Um, and let's see here. Just checking. Uh, Chris had a question earlier. And she's asked, asking, uh, if you do a cloud pour using the easy formula, would you use a pouring medium for the other paints? Uh, would you get cloud cells? Um, let's see. Normally, when I do the easy, or uh, when I do the easy cloud formula, I just mix up like one color uh, with the cloud mixture, and then the other colors I mix with the regular. Uh, with a regular pouring medium. So like either just flow troll and paint. Uh, and that's usually what I make, what, what I mix up. So just regular mixture of other paints and then the cloud mixture. And then that's it. If you wanted to, you could use um, Liquitex pouring medium or something like that in addition to flow troll. Um, and I'm sure you'd get some interesting effects with that. Um, hopefully that's what you're asking, Chris. Um, cause the cloud cells all pretty much come from just the cloud mixture. And that's kind of what we did here. We used two different cloud mixtures. Um, one thing I was wondering about is if you used like all cloud mixtures would the, would they kind of nullify each other, um, kind of cancel each other out? I think that might've happened here a little bit, uh, with the white. So it's hard to tell from, you know, just one painting. But hopefully that answered your question, Chris. Let's see here. If not, uh, just ask me, ask again, <laughs> I guess. Um, all right, let's see. Um, where, any questions? Jerry is here, hey, Jerry. Um, Donna thinks it looks like an albatross, or it did back at some point. Uh, and then Susan is asking, are the deeper black areas the black cloud? Yes. So right in here, like this is the black, like a black cloud effect right down in the, in this, let me move the painting up, right in this corner. Um, Cause it's, it's got this interesting lacing effects um, that are happening right in there. It's a little different than like the white cloud mixture in a regular cloud pour. Um, the black is, is usually much more subtle and we, we are getting a lot of blending and things happening. So, but it doesn't look like a, like a typical cloud pour. And of course it's a flip cup. So a floating flip cup, which normally you don't do with uh, cloud pours. So we did a lot of different things in this one. So... And uh, Monique thinks we should take some white off, uh, which is a good idea. At some point, maybe we did. We've kind of expanded all the white. But uh, let's see. Veronica likes it. She uses bright colors a lot, which is cool. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, yeah, I like to use a lot of neutralized colors and uh, I'm, I'm mixing a lot of my own colors now to get them a little more neutral and a little more subtlety in my paintings. And maybe keep just one bright and the rest of them are, uh, are a little less uh, intense. Cool. So thanks for all the, the great comments, everyone. I'm just checking uh, for questions. And uh, and Jay is like the compositional aspects um, that I talked about, and I'm always thinking about composition in the back of my. You know, I usually it's it's hard to verbalize it when you're doing demos. Um, I try to as best I can, but I'm always thinking about it when I'm tilting and stretching the paint. Thanks a lot, uh, Jay. And uh, Susan is asking if we can see the lacing up close. And uh, let me zoom in. Yeah, sure. And uh, 
<laughs> Monique, Monique, no socks were blown off. That's that's correct. Uh, at least mine weren't. They're still firmly on my feet. So let me uh, zoom in here. Maybe I can get a oops, that's out. A little closer look, and I'll move the the painting around a little bit. So let me go over here. So here it is. Um, Maybe I can adjust the exposure too. So this is some of the very subtle lacing um, that you see in the painting. Let me try one thing. Perhaps that helped a little bit to show it. It can be hard to pick up on the camera, but there's this very fine kind of intricate uh, lattice work type lacing that's happening. Let me move it over here. You can see it better on the corner here. So this is um, like that's the pewter or the silver creating this very fine lacing look in the paints. And over here, there's a little more right there in the black. So that's kind of typical of what happens with uh, the white cloud does that too. Um, but with the white cloud, it's usually darker lacing instead of like this is light lacing on a dark uh, background. With the white, it's the opposite. It's dark lacing against uh, the white background. And over here is, um, see, some of these cells look a little bit cloudy. Like this is kind of a cloudy effect here happening over here in the white a little bit, but not, not tons. There's, there's a little more lacing up here. So hopefully that helps kind of show you what the um, what the darker cloud mixtures kind of do. Um, at least when I've done them. So cool. So let me flip back here. I'm going to flip it over to uh, me. Hello again and uh, see if there's any other questions you had. That was a good, good idea, Susan. And uh, let's see. Uh, let's see here. I'm just, um, I've seen the <laughs> Monique Sock Socks comment, which is great. Let's see. Uh, cool. Uh, sorry. Uh, Veronica is asking, I may try sil uh, using silver in mine. Have you done that? Um, there's silver in this painting. Uh, there's black and white and silver, which was right here. And then also a, a pewter color, but, um, I, you could use, you could do silver instead of a black if you wanted to, it'd be a much brighter, like lighter color. But I've done I've done many uh, white and silver uh, paintings. They're always pretty. Great idea. Cool. And Veronica said a shimmery silver. Like I've not I don't think I've done like I tried a silver cloud mixture before. Like if that's what you're asking, like mix a a silver cloud mix. That could be very interesting though. Um, to see what happens with that. So cool. All right. Any other um, questions that you might have? I'd be happy to answer them. And uh, Navala is here. Hey, Navala. She says Pewter gives a, an eerie, shadowy look. Uh, yeah, it's a. It's a funny color. I really like it a lot. Um, in this particular painting, it looks, uh, it's like a very warmish gray, um, kind of a warm gray color. But um, yeah, it's funny. It kind of took over this painting, actually, the pewter. I didn't think I used that much, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a cool color. It's one of my favorites. I use it all the time now. And Carla is asking, uh, I've had a problem with the shimmer in metallic paint disappear 
Uh, is it the medium? Um, interesting question. I'm um, just trying to think. I guess it depends. It could be the medium if you're using, uh, I mean, they, they do get a little less shimmery uh, once they dry. And when you tilt them, you know, you will still see some of the, the shimmer in them. Um, but it depends on, I guess it's hard to say. Uh, it, I, it depends on what medium you're using, I guess. Carla, if you could tell me that, if it's just Floetrol or if you're adding other things to it, um, that would be helpful. And, uh, and Nancy is asking again about pricing. Uh, I know there are a lot of things that affect pricing, but would you tell a client that the painting won't last more than 10 years or so? Uh, it depends on, um, see, I, I wouldn't necessarily phrase it like that, Nancy, because we don't know. Um, and it really depends on what you're using, like putting in your paints. Uh, if you're if you're just using all like craft paints, for instance, um, I'd be maybe hesitant about um, you know selling that. Uh, I personally wouldn't sell um, a painting like made just of craft paints. Perhaps um, I I do those a lot, but you know not with the intention of you know selling them for a whole lot of money because um, craft paints. The problem with them is light fastness. And things like reds and yellows and purples, um, if the sun is beating on them, um, you know, they can just kind of lose the color. The color can kind of just go away. But it also, it all depends on where the painting is in the person's house. Because even a painting with all golden paints, you know, the most expensive paints you can get, uh, if they put it in a, on a wall, with sun beating on it, it's gonna fade. Um, that's just the way it is. Nothing is 100% light fast. Uh, so there's a, like a lot of considerations. Uh, I don't think I'd put any kind of a timeline on it um, because uh, we don't know. We don't, I mean, all, all of these things are uh, experimental types of things. Um, it's not like a classical, you know, oil painting where, where you know what's going to happen, you know, things like that. These are, these are abstract expressionist paintings um, using some experimental ingredients. And that's probably what I would, I would tell the customer. Say, um, you know, these are abstract paintings. We are, we're using um, some experimental, you know, ingredients. Um, it should last a long time, but I can't give you any guarantees. So it, you know, a lot of it depends on where they place the painting. Um, and, but I know of a, I know of an artist, like everyone, you know, is down on glue. They don't want to use glue as a medium. And, you know, I, I can understand that, you know, perfectly well, but she's used glue for 18 years and never had the glue yellow on her, just regular old Elmer's glue. So, and she's made, I don't know how many, you know, paintings with that. Not, you know, not, ab not, these types of paintings, she's more of a collage artist. So she uses, uh, you know, acrylics and paper and things, but she uses glue all over the place on them. Um, and she's never had a problem with it. So you never quite know with uh, longevity of paintings. So, but uh, if you're worried about that, price it accordingly. Um, so let's say you, you wanted to sell paintings with, uh, that have craft, paint in them or glue in them, um, you know, just price them uh, accordingly, like, uh, and maybe make them a little bit less. And then tell the client or just put a disclaimer on the description of the painting saying, um, you know, it's an abstract expressionist painting using uh, experimental techniques and ingredients. And uh, um, I, I expect the painting to last, uh, for a long time, but I can't, but no guarantees can be given because of the uh, nature of how the painting was created. So hopefully that gives you a little bit to think about. Um, we could talk about that for a long time about uh, you know, pricing and things like that. I wouldn't worry. I mean, unless you're selling your painting 
for $20,000, you know, uh, like a really big price. And, you know, in two weeks, it all falls apart, you know, which was not going to happen, you know, more than likely. I wouldn't be too concerned with like longevity of, of the paintings and things like that. Plus, you know, it depends on what you seal it with. If you put, if you put a UV coating on top of it, right there, you've extended the lifetime of your painting by quite a bit. So uh, hopefully that gives you some things to think about. Um, and it was helpful for you. Let's see. I'm, gonna, I'm checking other... Uh, here, Carla is saying, um, uh, going back to losing the shimmer in her silver, uh, a flow trial with the little GAC 800, not always, but sometimes it's just flat, even after varnish is applied. Um, I would say it's probably the GAC 800, personally. Um, I know it's a really popular product. I don't particularly love it all that much. Uh, I prefer Liquitex pouring medium about a thousand times more than the GAC 800. Um, and, you know, one thing it's, um, and I know, you know, like, oh my gosh, blasphemy, but, um, you know, I'm very, I'm, I've used it many, many times on many, many paintings. They never turn out uh, as good, at least in my, um, in my view, as paintings I've done with the Liquitex Basics. And one reason is uh, GAC 800, I mean, it's, it's made, it's, it's designed to be used for anti-crazing um, and anti-cracking, but not in like huge quantities. Um, and it's not 100% transparent. It dries uh, like slightly translucent, which means it's not like crystal clear when it dries. It dries a little bit milky. Um, so, and no one tells you that or talks about it, but it's not as transparent as Liquitex, uh, Liquitex pouring medium when it's dry. So right there, I don't love it. So um, that it, that's my thinking is um, the GAC could be part of the problem with that. So maybe substitute it out, like try a painting and just just leave the GAC out altogether. Just try it with Floetrol in your paints and water if you need it, and then see what happens. Um, or try uh, the Liquitex instead. Um, so hopefully that helps. And let's see here. Um, oh, another thing, Carla. Um, Novala just mentioned, Brad, could the metallic paint be too thin if it's disappearing? Um, yeah, how much paint are you adding to your uh, mixture? That, that's another big consideration. So um, I'd say if you're using like two parts Floetrol, one part paint, uh, you should get a very, um, it should be a very shimmery uh, finished product, you know, when the paint dries. So no, thanks, Novala. That's a great, that's a great, um, great comment. So and insight. Cool. And Chris is asking, hey, Brad, could you be uh, do a workshop on what we should or need to do if we're thinking of selling them at a, uh, at a fair or something for the novice? Um, yeah, we could have a talk about that, about selling, like selling your work, like at an event. If you, if you go to a fair, a craft fair or an art show, um, it depends. I mean, all of these shows and craft fairs operate a little differently. It, de it depends, you know, a lot depends on how they have their fair set up. But we could talk about that for sure. Maybe in the in the membership, we could do like a, a studio chat on that sometime and talk about selling what you need, like um, because you need a lot of stuff. And quite frankly, selling at fairs um, can be a massive pain in the butt. Uh, and uh, but but it can be very fun and it can be lucrative too, uh, depending on the fair. And those are usually you never quite know unless you've got a track record or talk to people that have have a track record of working at these different events and fairs. Um, but we could sure talk about that, like uh, what you need for pricing or, you know, taking payments and, uh, you know, how to price your work, uh, things like that, what you need to 
take with you. So sure, we could talk about that. Um, that's a great idea, Chris. So, and Carla is saying um, she used champagne gold that ended up just looking tan as an example. Yeah, that's, I'm wondering uh, now that Novala mentioned that, like how much paint are you using in your mixtures? Um, that could be a huge part of it. Like uh, if you're using like four parts Floetrol, two parts GAC 800 and one part paint, um, that's not enough paint. You'd have to increase that. So I would, I would say probably, you know, what I like to do is just the easy formula, two parts Floetrol, one part paint, um, and just give that a try. There's a super simple formula and see if you get better results. Um, I would give that a, a shot first because that is, I do that all the time and they're always um, kind of very intense and, and bright. And again, uh, the other thing would be like what brand of paint. Um, I'd also recommend using, you know, kind of the big ones that I always use, you know, Liquitex or, you know, Master's Touch even or Artist Loft all dry, kind of nice and shiny, or Amsterdam, of course. Um, and uh, so you're very welcome, Nancy. She um, got something out of what I was babbling about earlier. So that's great. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, you know, and we're, you know, just being an artist and we're, you know, some people call this a craft. Some people call it an art form. I, I personally call it, think it's a, a form of art. Uh, it can be used as crafts as well. Um, but everyone's different, you know, as far as what they're using. Um, and um, everyone has different views of um, what's sellable, what's not sellable. Uh, I mean, people are selling these paintings all over the place all the time. Uh, I mean, they're selling them on the on the cheapest canvases, probably with um, you know pretty cheap paints, and they don't mind one bit, little bit. So, I compliment you on having like artistic integrity with um, you know what you want to put into your art because it does you know reflect back on you. So, um, these are all great things to think about when you're thinking about selling your work. So, I'm glad that could help you, Nancy. Um, and uh, uh, Lynn is saying, Elmer's glue is not good to use. Uh, I use it in my mixture. Um, well, it depends. See, again, this all depends. These are all, um, the, there could be many different answers to these questions, but Elmer's glue wall, I mean, I use it a lot too, like solely as my pouring medium sometimes. Um, and those are specific types of, paintings I like to make. And uh, would I sell them? Probably, sure. Um, is it an archival product? No, Elmer's is not an archival product. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's it's white glue. But again, I mentioned that artist that I know of who has been working with Elmer's glue um, for 18 years now. And she's never had issues with it yellowing or uh, cracking on her, you know, so to her, it's just fine. It's, and it is, uh, it depends on who you talk to with archival glue. And uh, so, cause some people will, will, uh, will talk about the acidity of archival of like Elmer's glue. It's, it's, it's uh, got an acidity to it, but unless it's on paper, um, it doesn't really matter, you know? Cause also stretcher bars, have a lot of acid in them too. So it's, it's all, all these things are like relative. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, if you like using Elmer's glue, that's awesome. Go continue to use it. Uh, I, I use different mediums for different things. I only use Elmer's glue when I want to get specific types of cells in my paintings. Uh, other than that, I don't use it at all. Like I don't mix it with Floetrol uh, for my Floetrol paintings. And I mean, Floetrol, I mean, it's a painting product, but it's not a fine art product. So who knows what the effects of Floetrol will be in 20, 50 years? I can't say, I, and no one really knows. So, but I'm not really too concerned about it. I'm not worried about it. So um, there are plenty of paintings in the museums that are, you know, priceless, that are falling apart. 
So I wouldn't be too concerned about the longevity of our paintings. And uh, Elsie is, is mentioning, is DecoArt a quality craft paint? Their metallics are widely used. DecoArt is a good brand, um, and, but metallics in particular are a tricky uh, topic because, uh, and every paint company, none of them can really give them a light fastness value. Um, Liquitex, Golden, uh, even you know, Nova Color, all of them, when you have a metallic paint and it'll look at the light fastness, it always will say NA or not applicable or you cannot grade it. And it's because uh, the metallics are made up differently. Um, there's all these microparticles and different things in them. So there's not a traditional, it's not a traditional pigment uh, in the paint uh, like cobalt blue or um, uh, cadmium red. All of these other things um, have been around a long time and there's ways of making them. So they will retain their light fastness. Uh, one paint in particular that I used a lot when I was in my younger days doing oil painting is alizarin crimson, but alizarin crimson is not light fast. And, you know, finally uh, brands came out with uh, a light fast version of alizarin crimson. Um, because, you know, after years and years, the alizarin crimson would just lose its, its color. But um, so, but metallics in particular are difficult to, to uh, uh, talk about with light fastness just because um, they can't rate them, really. I don't know exactly why. I'm not the, I don't know all the scientific reasons behind it. I just know that um, none of them have a light fastness or very few of them have a light fastness uh, rating. And normally, like Liquitex Basics, all the other colors are one, which is like the best. And that's good for like, they say, I think 100 years or 50 years or something like that. Then there's a two, which is pretty good. Um, and, then, and then I think there's down the line, I think there's a three, which is kind of ah, shaky. I think most craft paints probably fall in that category. Um, just because with craft paints, they're cheap, uh, they're very affordable because they use less pigment and lower quality pigments in their paints. Um, and it's just because it's, you know, it's cheap craft paint. So, but also, you know, a lot of people are using house paint and I don't think house paint is archival at all. Um, so, and I use, I mean, I use some house paint in this painting we just did, but, you know, smallish amounts of it. Um, you know, it's, there are small amounts, plus there's a bunch of other stuff and other paints in this painting. So I don't use base coats of house paint. Uh, when I do blooms, I don't like to use the house paint. That's why I don't do lots and lots of blooms, um, that and other reasons. But so, but I wouldn't, I would feel confident in going with the, uh, uh, using deco art, um, craft paint and, and metallics as well. They are a higher quality. They're a better quality of craft paints, but like much higher than let's say Apple Barrel, because that's about as cheap as you can get. But uh, but um, I use their metallics too all the time, so um, I feel confident with them, Elsie. So sorry for the long, 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 long answer. So uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, let's see. I'm probably falling behind on the comments. Sorry. Or the question. Sorry. Uh, and Susan is asking, can we do another painting tonight? Um, I don't have enough paints mixed up, Susan. Um, but I would love it if, if you would do a painting. That would be great. And hey, Gail is here. Hey, Gail. Thanks for stopping by. Um, great to see you. Gail is a fantastic uh, acrylic pour artist and photographer, by the way. I envy that about her. So, you know, Monique likes Susan's idea a lot of another painting. Uh, I don't think tonight, but um, that's a great idea. Next week, we'll be doing lots of paintings in the membership come, come Wednesday. 
All right. Um, so let's see here. Just checking for some. And uh, KC is is mentioning. I wonder if resin over the glue helps. Um, it would help it from. I mean, I don't really know. You can always resin things. Resin kind of, you know, it's like, uh, um, you know, it's in there forever after you resin it. Um, but resin, you know, it, it's resin by itself is not inherently uh, UV. It's not a UV uh, protectant unless it has UV additives in it. And some resins do, some resins don't. Uh, it all depends on the resin. Some resins will yellow a lot over time. So um, you have to be very careful if you're using resin. And again, where it's, you know, if the sun is beating down on it. And by the way, like no painting or original art should ever be in direct sunlight ever really. Cause it's, you know, it's going to fade. And it, the sun is just relentless when it comes to uh, paints and any kind of uh, artwork or paint, um, furniture, anything really. The sun will just beat it to death. But uh, but with resin, like there are resins that have UV protectants in them. Um, those are the best type to use. You also want to find a resin that's uh, uh, that's been kind of graded and for trans transparency over time, and that does not yellow. Some of the cheaper ones that are really not intended for artwork will yellow a lot. So you have to be very careful with uh, using resin. Um, all right, and and uh, I'm getting a member question. I'm having a, I'm having a hard time finding the PDF you did for the swipe. Um, where do I find it in the membership? If you go in the community, the membership community, and if you go to technique of the month, that topic right there. Uh, if you click on that, uh, the very top post will be the swipe technique. And if you click on that post, it'll open up the replay of our video and there will be the PDF right inside there. And uh, um, that will be, and you can just uh, print that out or download it. And if you have problems, uh, you could always message me on, um, uh, you, could, you could always send me an email and I could just send it to you if you still have problems or just send me a message and I can direct you better. Um, hopefully that helps. And uh, let's see here. And Vet has arrived. Um, hey, Vet, you missed the painting and lots of lively discussion. <laughs> so um, at least I think it's lively. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, Monique, this is the perfect. Uh, uh, Example of what we did tonight. Blasphemy and socks not blowing off is what happened tonight. <laughs> well said, Monique. My gosh. That's great. Uh, and Susan is um, has a great tip. Check Etsy for sale prices. Yeah, I would say, yeah, check Etsy is a good place to look for sale prices. I would say look for painters and paintings that are very similar to yours. Um, and then take into account your uh, experience level and um, factor that in there. And uh, you know, also, you know, see how much you have in your paintings, uh, put in you know, some kind of a number for cost uh, for you know, your materials, uh, for packaging. That's a big one um, because shipping is, you know, shipping is expensive. You have to decide if you want to offer free shipping or uh, charge for shipping. And I'll tell you which one's most popular. The free shipping, of course. Uh, no one wants to pay for shipping. So you have to uh, elevate your prices to accommodate for the shipping costs. Um, so, and then you have to factor in, you know, your time, investment, uh, and profit that you want to make. 
So there's a lot that goes into it, but Etsy is a great place to get a kind of a baseline of what, what people are charging. And, uh, but also make sure that store, whatever Etsy store that is, they're actually selling stuff. Um, cause there could be a store that has a whole lot of paintings for sale and they're expensive. And you're like, yes, that's awesome. But they not, might not be selling any of them. So you have to make sure it's a, um, a profitable store that you're looking at, but that's a great, uh, great advice, Susan. And um, let's see, Star has got a question. She's new to acrylic pouring, which is awesome. Do you have any tips to get rid of air bubbles? I use a heat gun, but some bubbles are still visible. Thank you for sharing your art knowledge. You're very welcome. Um, my, uh, the thing I like to do best for air bubbles is uh, to use a torch. A heat gun is okay, but like a small little torch like this, um, this is like a little culinary torch, works better in my opinion of popping air bubbles. Um, you can get this on Amazon. It's like $15. If you go to my Amazon store, I have this particular one, which is my favorite one that I've used. Um, it's very simple to use. It's just got a little trigger and you pull the trigger, the flame comes out, it works great. Just move it over uh, slow, like rather quickly over your base coat if you're applying a base coat um, to your canvas first. And that's normally when I'm popping air bubbles, I put my base coat down, I pop the air bubbles with my torch. I didn't do it in this demo, um, but, uh, and that's usually it. I, nor I normally don't torch over the painting after I have poured it. You can, of course. Um, another tip on air bubbles is you could let your paint sit a little while um, and that will get rid of a lot of the air bubbles. Uh, overnight is ideal. If you are that patient, I am not usually, <laughs> but um, those are some tips on air bubbles. But uh, but uh, great question, Star, and thanks for joining us. All right, hey Kathleen is on here. Awesome, hey Kathleen, you know Oz, uh, Kathleen Osmore, Cos Creations is amazing. So that's fantastic. Hey, Kathleen, glad you could drop by. That's so cool. Yeah, we're doing um, swipes in our membership. And so I'll be talking about you next week because you're the, the queen of swipes. That's, a, that's awesome. And uh, and uh, Jerry um, has been out of the loop a little bit. Uh, have you mentioned February is pouring technique yet? Um, yeah, we started uh, February, the February technique last week, and it's a swipe technique. So I went, I did the swipe walkthrough um, last Wednesday. It's in the membership if you want to check it out, um, Jerry. I have a PDF for you. And I did one demo, like a simple demo uh, Wednesday, but we're going to be doing three or four different uh, variations of the swipe this coming week in the membership. So hope you can make it for that. It'll be fun. Swipes are awesome. So glad you could make it tonight, Jerry. And uh, let's see here. Any other? Uh, here's a question. And uh, Rust-Oleum is a good finish, a clear gloss. Yeah, I've used um, spray, like a spray finish uh, many times. It works just just fine for me. Um, yeah, make sure you get like a crystal clear finish. Rust-Olea makes one. Um, Krylon makes one, which I like. Um, yeah, those work good. Maybe like two or three coats of that. And you can kind of go in different directions. So put one on and then go the other way. And the second coat, make sure you let the 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 clear coat dry in between, but uh, yeah, they work good. And, uh, and KC is mentioning uh, photographs, keep them out of the sun. Absolutely. So pretty much keep everything out of the sun, this, including yourself. So like, like the vampires do. Oh my gosh. Uh, I lost my place. Um,
Let's see here. And Sonia has uh, used some marine resin, which she did um, when she poured her signs. The marine resin is, is, I mean, it depends on the resin. That's, um, it's not really designed for art, but um, it should hold up. I mean, it'll hold up pretty good. Cool. And uh, Carla was terrified <laughs> the first time she used the torch. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's nothing to be scared of. It's, it's a very, I'll, I'll turn it on for you. Even it's a very small little flame, you know, don't put your finger in it. It'll hurt a lot. You can adjust it bigger, smaller. Um, it's very safe, you know, again, you know, it's fire. So always use the utmost caution, but, um, but little torches like this are, um, once you use it a couple times, you'll, you're in good shape. So, so it's the big torches that can get kind of nerve wracking. So, and then Navala's got a great point. Never torch alcohol ink. That's a great tip, Novala, because you will set it on fire. Absolutely. Uh, oh my gosh. Um, and uh, all right, let's see. I think I reached the end of the questions. Um, and uh, Sonia will let us know what happens to her uh, her resin that she used uh, marine resin on. That'd be great to see what happens, uh, Sonia. Let us know. And uh, Jill is uh, wondering about, I wonder about torching if you have used alcohol to initially wet your pigments. Um, I'd be very careful then. Jill, because you could probably set them on fire. Uh, I don't use alcohol in any of my mixtures, so uh, I, I never worry about that. But yeah, if you're using alcohol, um, yeah, be very careful uh, with your with it with your torch. Um, so, but that's a great point, Jill. Yeah, I'll be interested. Like, uh, I know some people, you know, add alcohol to the acrylic paints to create cells. Um, that's a that's a valid technique. I never really found that to to work well for me. Um, but uh, yeah, be careful if you're using alcohol. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. If there's any other questions, last minute questions, uh, please throw them in the comments. Maybe I'll flip over and I'll show you the painting one last time. I'll zoom out a little bit. So. In case you missed it, here we go. Let me zoom out to the, the full thing. Here we go. I'll move it down. So here's our painting. It was a, a double cloud mixture. So I had a white cloud mix and a black cloud mix. And then I had a little bit of a silver. I'll put them over here, silver and pewter. And uh, this is what we got. So it was just an experiment to see what would happen with uh, two different types of cloud mix. And it turned out interesting. You know, again, socks not blown off, but um, it's a fun experiment. So we got some cool lacing and stuff from the kind of the dark cloud mix. So will I experiment with this again? Maybe we'll see. Um, but, uh, it was fun to do. So I hope you enjoyed it. All right. So let me flip back here and, uh, and I don't see any, uh, final questions. So I will uh, say, have a happy or a wonderful weekend. Hope you have a fun weekend. You can do some painting. Um, if you try anything that you like posted in our group, the Acrylic Pouring Club group, that would be awesome. I'd li like to take a look at what you have come up with. Be careful with your torches and uh, don't use alcohol around them and uh, have fun. All right. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you next week. 
And uh, thanks so much for joining me and the great questions and awesome comments. So thanks, everyone. I will talk to you very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>